Okay, we were just talking about speech here and variations on the standard treatment. We were on page 277 and identifying a certain type of speech or speaking pattern that the analyst would be looking for in analytic experience. And that would be the types of stutters and stammers, what we now popularly know as Freudian slips. Now the question becomes, what do you do with that? If this is a communicative practice that you are attending, attending to, what might come of this in therapy? Prior to this, quote, turning point, Lacan says there in the second full paragraph on page 277, turning point in quotation marks here because Lacan thinks it's a wrong turn. And the wrong turn he is talking about here is the way that analytic technique in the mid-50s had turned away from, at least in his view, um, the original psychoanalytic semantics that he discusses above. Prior to this so-called turning point, it was by deciphering such material, and here we're talking about Freudian slips, that the subject was able to remember his history along with the outlines of the conflict that determined his symptoms. Remembering here is very important. Elsewhere, Lacan talks about this as psychoanalytic anamnesis, Greek word for remembering or recalling or recollecting. This weird form of remembering the past. And this is one of the great wagers that Freud comes up with and that Lacan really wants to hone, it, hone in on here um, in the mid-50s. Is that people who are struggling with their past are usually struggling with the past that they would like to let go of and forget, but that won't let go of them and constantly causes them to remember it. So here we're talking about um, someone being done with the past, but the past not being done with them. And when you live a life like this, the past is constantly determining your present. It's controlling your life. Past mistakes, slips, feelings of guilt, all these types of things keep coming up. That is the past controlling your present. In psychoanalysis, by very carefully trying to learn to listen to how you speak, you're able to start hearing secret affinities, strange wormholes between the present in which you're communicating and the past that has been over-determining your action. Now this is different because what it effectively does is it transforms your past into your history. This would be the goal. So that the past no longer overdetermines your present, but has been resubjectivized, that has been reclaimed, owned in a new way, in a way that allows you to come to terms with your past. And that's a very good way to put this. In psychoanalysis, you learn to come to terms with your past. And in coming to terms with it, reclaim it transform it into your history. Not something that you still are, but something that you were in order to become something different. And that's very important here. The ultimate horizon here would be um, someone who has enough compassion towards themselves to recognize that even the worst things they've done in their past are still part and parcel of what has made them into the person they are today which is a person that they kind of like. So they wouldn't change anything about the past because if they change something about the past, it would change who they are today. And that would presume that they're not content with who they are today. Doesn't mean you can't live a life that has some regrets in it. But if you live a life strictly of regret, you might benefit from this technique is Lacan's wager. And he's getting it straight from Freud. It was by deciphering weird slips of the tongue that you could remember your past and transform it into your history. And with that, the outlines of the conflict that determined your symptoms up to that point. And the value to be granted in technique to the elimination of symptoms was based on how well the order in his history was restored and the gaps in it were filled. So the idea here is that the standard or the test to see if it was working, if the therapy was working, was that you would be able to start telling a pretty coherent story 
about where you came from, about why you are the way you are today. This history would be restored and the gaps would be filled. The observed elimination of symptoms demonstrated a dynamic in which the unconscious was defined as a clearly con constituting subject. Now this is important here. The unconscious here is that part of your past that you had never come to terms with prior to therapy. And it was a constituting subject because it was an active agent. The unconscious here was the thing that was moving you in certain directions, determining your conduct, constituting you, determining who you were. So here we see the unconscious as an active agent, a constituting agent, one that constitutes who you are. And the idea was that by addressing the symptoms and marching them back to their primal scenes or their causes, you could somehow come to terms with them in ways that would cause the symptoms to decline. You wouldn't stutter or stammer as much when you tried to say the word mom or dad or whatever the case may be. The unconscious was defined as a clearly constituting subject in this case, since it sustained symptoms in their meaning before it was revealed. And we experienced the unconscious directly, recognizing it in the ruse of disturbances in which the repressed compromises with the censorship. So this would be the censorship of the superego, which you can look up, combined with that of the ego to some extent, and the unconscious coming up with compromises that would allow for certain expressions to pop up at certain times, like the weird stuff that happens in your dream, but not so weird that it would cause you to wake up from the dream, resulting in what we call a nightmare. Now we're getting close to this wrong turn that Lacan says current analytic technique has taken. Notice, if then the analyst gave the subject the solution to his symptom, but the symptom persisted, it was because the subject resisted recognizing its meaning. Analysts thus concluded that it was this resistance that must above all be analyzed. Now this is crucial here. So somebody shows up and every time they start to talk about their mom, they stammer, mom, 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 something like this. Okay, this is clearly a slip of some kind, a stammer, a hesitation, where there's some issue there. And through analysis, through careful listening to oneself and having the help and guidance of an analyst, you might come to terms with some previous issues you have with your mom, which make it difficult for you to talk about her. That's what the stammer tells the analyst, is that this is somebody who is struggling to talk about someone in their life. A slight hesitation, a correction, a stammer, usually is a red flag that says, oh, there's some conflict, some past issue there that needs to be addressed. Now, if the analyst were to show up and say, hey, I notice every time you say mother, you stammer. You use other M words, but you don't stutter on those. You stutter on mother. I would guess there's something there. Now, if somebody were to say that to you, you would resist it. You might say, are you tripping? No, there's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with my past. My mother doesn't have anything to do with this. How dare you, sir? You see what I'm saying? That is resistance. And the way that happens is you are here resisting the meaning of the symptom that the analyst would present to you. And so then the question becomes, where's this resistance coming from? Why are you resisting this so intensely? And what happens at this moment, Lacan says, is that analytic technique is tempted to now focus on the resistance, less on the symptoms, less on the unconscious that is constituting the subject at the level of their symptoms, and more on the resistance to cure that we see. What is up with this resistance? Analysts thus conclude that resistance must above all be analyzed. The focus now shifts to resistance, but notice how this turn unfolds. 277, getting closer to the bottom. Note that this conclusion still puts its faith in interpretation, that great, important production of truth that occurs through listening interpretation. But it was the particular aspect of the subject in which people sought this resistance that led to the approaching deviation. Here we're talking about this wrong turn. So here it is. 
the particular aspect of the subject that people sought when they were looking at resistance. People looked for resistance in a certain part of the subject, and that part Lacan's going to identify as the ego. The target here being ego psychology, which you can also look up. It was the particular aspect of the subject known as the ego, not the unconscious, but the ego, not the part of you that is unconscious, but the part of you that is acutely aware, fancies itself aware, the part of you that you usually assign with the term me the ego here, your sense of self. This particular aspect of the subject is where people started to look for resistance. And this led to the wrong turn that Lacan is talking about here. For it is clear that this notion tends to take the subject to be constituted in his discourse. Here, the discourse of the ego. Notice the emphasis on the ED here, the constituted subject. Versus above, we have the constituting subject that is the unconscious. This is going to become important. It's a subtle move, but very significant here. Should the deviation go on to seek his resistance outside of this discourse, it will be irremediable. No one will come back to the question of the constituting function of interpretation regarding its failure. So Lacan is trying to separate these two notions of something that is constituted in a discourse, by a discourse, and something that is the, constitu the constitutive agent, the constituting subject of that discourse. There's the person who's speaking, and there is what is spoken. And he's trying to separate these two and suggest that there's been some kind of weird confusion in current analytic technique, where the constitutive or constituting agent, the unconscious, has been mistaken as the constituted effect of the ego's speech. And the ego has been mistaken as the constituting agent of the patient's speech, here at the level of resistance, when in fact what we know, according to Lacan, is that the ego is, on the contrary, the effect a constituted element that follows out of and flows from the subject's speech. The ego is an effect structure, not the origin, not the agential force behind an utterance. The unconscious is the agential force behind the utterance. And the ego is something that is effected. It's an effect, a reaction to, you might even say, what comes out. So this is going to be important as we go through here. Again, at the end of 277, Lacan really summarizes what he's talking about here. We're looking at the verbalization of chains of speech in which the subject constitutes his history. There's that word, constitutes again. The next turn here is to this ego that is presumed to be the resistor. And that's where we're going to go on page 278.